This is In Search of the Invisible Army, The Caregiver Story, a podcast miniseries brought to you by Havas Links. I'm Paul Eccles. I'm at QMC Hospital in Nottingham to meet Iris. Um, how long have you been in the hospital for, Iris? I think it's just over a week, this one. Yes. How are you feeling today? I want to go home. I don't know what it is that I've got. As the doctors know what I've got, I don't. Iris has multiple myeloma. She's nearly 90, and as you can hear, she's very frail. The last few months, she's needed a lot of help from her husband, Ivan. What kind of things are you having to do to help care for Ivan? Well, meals. And all sorts of things. Get her, get her up. Bathroom. A lot of things, yeah. Ivan's 89, and it's not been easy for him. He tells me later that Iris has been struggling to get to the bathroom. She's been sick a lot. He's been having to deal with this, to get a dress, to help around, and to do the cooking. And it's not all stuff he's familiar or comfortable with doing. Well, no, I don't know whether I can do it all. I can do, I mean, I can manage breakfast, can't I? And uh, something else, but it's a bit night meals, it's a... Cooking, you see. I have been doing it, but it's a struggle anyway. I'm not, I mean, I'm not as good as I was, because I had a fall and banged my head, you see, and that's why this everything started after that with Iris. See, mine cleared up, but Iris's didn't. See? Mm. Iris and Ivan don't have any kids, and whilst Iris's nephew has been helping out where he can, it's clear that if Ivan's going to keep looking after Iris and keep her at home, he's going to need a bit of extra help. While Ivan is tending to his wife, I speak to Iris's doctor about their situation. Dr Tahir Masood is a consultant geriatrician at QMC and president-elect of the British Geriatric Society. He's got some health issues which need to be dealt with. In order to allow him to maintain his quality of life, I think he would really benefit from extra social services, providing some extra help for him to continue looking after his wife. I can tell from talking to Iris that that's what she wants for her husband to carry on looking after her and for her to stay at home with him. Is Ivan good at taking care of you? Yes. We've been married over 50 years. We've never had a crossword. <laughs> yeah, we did everything, didn't we? We went to Devon Cornwall, we went everywhere. We, we, did, we enjoyed it, didn't we? We were dancing up three days a week up till March, till I fell in the bungalow. Mm. And yeah. who's the better dancer? Well, I've got medals and she hasn't. <laughs> so, uh, not really, you know. I'd say we're both about the same, aren't we? I'd say who remembers the steps. Ah, you, she remembers the steps, I apologise. <laughs> Situations like Iris's and Ivan's are only becoming more common. The problems of an ageing population are well documented, but to put some figures to it, the percentage of the world's population aged 65 and over is expected to almost double by 2050, with those over 80 the fastest growing subset of this group. But what will that mean for carers? Here's Dr Mahiben Marathapu, former senior fellow to the CEO of the NHS and co-founder of the tech-enabled home care provider, Sarah. These conditions are getting more complex, not less complex. People are requiring more and more help at home. I think we will only need more carers. I think even Age UK recently said that there are a million people who require care but are not getting it. So if anything, there's a shortage at the moment. Current trends would agree with Mahiben. The number of carers of Ivan's age has more than doubled in the last decade. It's important to understand up front what we mean by the term carer. I'm talking about those often referred to as family or informal carers, who spend their days and nights looking after wives, brothers, mums, granddads, friends and neighbours. Some carers live with the people they care for, Others travel to care, and some do it at a great distance. It's not just the demand for carers like Ivan that's set to increase. The number of carers in the UK is expected to rise by 40% in the next 20 years, from 6.5 million to 9 million. Looking further afield, the World Health Organisation anticipates that in some developing nations, needs will soar by over 400% in the coming decades. As compelling as the figures are, talking in numbers can perhaps mask what is a pretty straightforward fact. This really affects all of us. There's five of us in my immediate family, and three of us have filled what people would describe as a caring role. That's not unusual. Carers UK say three and five of us will be carers in our lifetime. One or the other day, all of us 
either you will be a carer or somebody will be providing the care i don't know when that will happen but during our lifetime so we will play one of those roles that was anil patel ceo and founder of carers worldwide a charity that operates in low and middle income countries in this three part podcast series we're going to take a closer look at the lives of carers and the huge role they play in supporting our healthcare systems we'll hear from carers from lots of different places as well as leading experts from healthcare and major carer charities we'll look at whether carers get enough support i felt i ha- i had to fight and i still am fighting for every single thing at how caring affects people's relationships she she feels that she's more michael's mother than michael's wife and what it does to their well-being and sense of self-worth i think that made me stronger and i i kind of just realized that i'm part of this army of people out there and it's it is something that we should be proud of we'll see the challenges care is face now they were talking about potential amputation if he didn't didn't make the progress he needed to the great knowledge they gained through their experiences sometimes the carer is the person that knows more than the professional sitting in front of them and the tremendous force for good they can be for others i get a lot of energy also of helping people a lot of the research behind this series has come out of an industry white paper havas links produced earlier in the year just a quick note havas links is a global healthcare communications company alongside everything you'll hear on the podcast there's a fair amount of studies statistics and other supporting evidence in the white paper more than i can possibly cover here So if that takes your interest head to invisible-army.com. On the website you'll also find some interesting blogs and a series of films featuring interviews with some of the experts we spoke to as well as some keynote talks. In this first podcast we're going to look at the recognition and support carers receive. But first I'd like to focus briefly on their importance to healthcare. So I think carers are invaluable. They are a key component to making the health and care system function. and it is the regular daily compassionate care that people receive that allows them hopefully to stay out of hospitals uh, and where possible not even need to see their gps if we didn't have family carers looking after people in their homes or in other contexts it would probably cause a lot of the system to collapse speaking frankly mahi bank called care is invaluable actually the value of their contribution has been measured In the UK it's estimated to be worth 132 billion pounds a year. That's roughly the same as the entire NHS budget. Of course, it's not just about the money. Carers have a huge impact on the lives of the people they take care of, as Dr. Sarah Jarvis told me. Sarah is a GP and the clinical director of patient.co.uk. I've spent 27 years as a GP and I don't think a day goes by without me being in awe of the carers who look after my patients. To have a carer around who cares for you loves you is your companion but also provides for your physical needs can make all the difference in the world Sarah's right it really can make a difference healthcare professionals might spend years honing their expertise in medicine but some carers spend just as much time honing their expertise in one person administering medications observing symptoms and behaviors helping a person get in and out of bed feeding washing and emotionally supporting them here's an ill from carers worldwide again quite often professionals don't recognize carers know what is best for their loved one quite often we look at carers are labor force not as a knowledge force we as a professionals we hardly spend a time with them and we ask so many questions and at the end whatever information we provide or skills or knowledge or training it is the caregivers who are implementing that knowledge whatever changes we are seeing in the person being cared for that is because of the carers studies show that the help of a family carer can improve adherence to meds and healthy living habits one in particular showed that relapse rates amongst people with schizophrenia can be reduced by as much as 20% if family carers are included in treatment so care is not only a huge help to patients to doctors and to healthcare systems the impact they have on therapy outcomes also means they're an asset to pharmaceutical companies and treatment providers here's elizabeth egan executive director of strategy and innovation at AstraZeneca Global. 
Carers are huge contributors to successful outcomes for patients. They become experts when it comes to things like symptom tracking, monitoring what patients are eating, monitoring how patients are sleeping, um, ensuring that patients take their medication at the right time in the right quantity, and monitoring things like how stressed is the patient. Basically, they are an absolute lifeline for that patient and, and a rich source of information for us as a pharma industry. But do we recognise the value of carers' contribution to healthcare? Sarah Jarvis doesn't think so. I suspect as a nation we completely fail to recognise what a crucial role carers play and how not only our National Health Service but our social care system would crumble without them. It is very difficult to keep that in the front of your mind at all times because perhaps they've always been there. And neither does Anil Patil. Carers are invisible, they are hidden behind the curtain. They are among us, but we don't have the eyes to see them. And maybe that is because of that invisibility, there is not much recognition. I would like to say one more, uh, that in my opinion, carers are wounded healers. They have wound within them, but nobody has the eyes to see that wound, to heal that wound. Anil describes quite beautifully a sentiment that ran throughout our research. That word, invisible, came up time and time again in our conversations. The first time I heard it was when I spoke to Shazia. I think care is a sort of almost invisible in society because we all sort of think of it, oh, yeah, you're just looking after your mum or your brother or your sister because that, that's what you do. It's sort of one of the main family values that everyone has that we are taking people for granted then. Carers are taken for granted. Shazia is 22. She balances caring for a mum who has Parkinson's around working full time. So because it's a progressive illness, I've had to take on more challenges with her condition as time's gone on. Um, it started off where she was quite um, independent still, um, whereas now she needs support with almost all aspects of life so it's everything from emotional support to helping um, give her tablets and stuff like personal care as well. I think caring herself is a positive thing. I think um, now looking back I, don't, I couldn't have imagined my life in a different way. Shazia has some help from professional carers but other than that it's just her and her mum. It's been that way for a long time. Shazia's an only child and her parents separated when she was young. Before we hear more from Shazia Think back for just a second how you pictured your parents when you were really small. You relied on them to be strong, to shield you from the difficulties and threats of the world, to pick you up when you fell down, to dust you off and to set you going again. For most of us, this image fades as we grow to adulthood and gradually take on more responsibilities for our own lives. For Shazia, that image shattered before she was even ten. I was eight or nine at the time. And it was just so hard, just being told that she's got this incurable illness. We, we don't know. We are, all we know is that it's going to get worse with time. We don't know at what sort of scale or how quickly it will worsen. Um, and it was like when I used to see my friends and um, parents picking them up from school and they were perfectly fine. And then my mum's like left side started shaking. And it was horrible. It was just... Because one day she was fine and it, it was almost like overnight that this illness just came out of nowhere. In an instant, Shazia's world had been turned upside down by a disease she'd never even heard of. She says she was in no way prepared, and at nine years old, how could she be? But it's not just young carers like Shazia that feel this way. A Carers UK survey of 2,100 carers found that 75% felt just as unready as Shazia. The route to caring doesn't necessarily allow for you to get set. Some face an event that changes their life in an instant. An accident, a sudden deterioration in health, or an unexpected diagnosis. Suddenly the new carer is thrust into a world of medical terminology and difficult decisions, as Emily Holtzhausen, Director of Policy and Public Affairs at Carers UK, explains. It's extraordinary, really, that we ask nurses to go through um, really important and valuable training, and yet we sometimes ask families to do exactly the same tasks with no backup or information. Other new carers experience what Janet Dunnett describes in her book The Dwindling as need creep. 
gradually and almost unknowingly taking on more and more responsibilities in the face of a decline that progresses at imperceptible increments, as Becky, another young carer, told us. Being a carer, you don't just get told, oh, you're going to be a carer now. It literally just, you just start taking on that role. So my sister came, I helped out with the nappies, the cleaning, um, feeding her and bits like that. So you just naturally help out and then it's only until you kind of, when you're doing it every day and you're same thing and you start to realise, oh, mate, I am a carer and that, that's what you do, really. That said, some of the carers we spoke to did actually feel that they'd had a bit of a heads up about what was coming. A partner, a carer I spoke to from India, found out during pregnancy that a daughter, Sanvi, would be born with paralysis down one side of her body. So a partner did a lot of reading before Sanvi was born, consuming as many books and articles as she could get her hands on. Another carer, Karen, who also shared her story with us, knew all about her partner Yvette's health issues before they got together. Did it make a difference? No. Both Karen and Aparna said that when it came to it, there were aspects of caring that they were in no way ready for. But let's go back to Shazia. At the start, I found it really difficult to talk about it to anyone because I just thought, like, why is it my mum? Um, so I'm going to oh, no, it's fine, And I think it was... It was really hard because we didn't know much about Parkinson's. And it's not really one of those illnesses that is... is sort of well recognised um, even now. Shazia's struggle to accept what was happening to her mum and the ensuing and all-consuming feelings of uncertainty were common amongst the carers we spoke to. Floris, a carer from the Netherlands who looks after his wife who has MS, described her diagnosis as a punch in the face. The uncertainty was horrible because one minute we were being told it's incurable but then people, she was still living with it. It was just... It was, you were just thinking, but how can it worsen, you know, will she end up being completely paralysed or will she, how how can her symptoms, because I'd never seen it in any other relation, like a grandparent or anything, I'd not seen it in a, a friend or anyone, even on television, so I think it was the uncertainty that was probably making us the most anxious. Especially given her young age. It's easy to see why Shazia would find it so difficult to come to terms with the fact that her life had been completely altered by events beyond her control or understanding. And it's at times like this, when everything is so turbulent and awash with uncertainty, when people feel at their most powerless and vulnerable, that carers like Shazia are most in need of support. But sadly, they don't always get it. Do you think they recognised your needs as a carer? No, I, I don't think... Not... In those early, well, I don't think they do do in general. I, I think they, I think there's not enough out there, if I'm honest. I don't think there's anywhere near enough support out there for carers. I think you have to sort of go out of your way or look yourself to find it. Emily Holtzhausen from Carers UK says the first step for carers getting support is identification. That is, for the carer to identify with their role and for the people around them to recognise this. Well, we think it's hugely important to be recognised and identified. Our recent research showed that uh, people take too long to recognise themselves and identify themselves as a carer. If they do that, and they do that early, and they get the right information and advice, it can help them to stay and work for longer, it can improve their health and well-being, it can improve the, the, the care that they feel that they're providing, and it, overall it improves everybody's quality of life. So it's hugely important. Um, there are a lot of what people call hidden carers. So they are people that don't necessarily identify themselves. They're not known to services. Uh, and there are certain groups that remain more hidden, if you like. And they include, for example, children who are caring for a parent or a sibling. They are people who are potentially older and people don't necessarily notice or think that a 92-year-old that a might be lifting a man out of bed every morning. Uh, and it's very important that people really think about caring and identify carers and put them in touch with support. There are a number of reasons why carers remain hidden. One of them is actually the label itself, carer. To some, it's hugely important to have something that describes their role, but not everybody likes it. As I said earlier, these people are daughters, husbands, mothers, friends, and it can feel like taking on the title carer diminishes this relationship. 
Emily said that whatever their feelings towards the term were, what was important was to get people to acknowledge that they were taking on extra responsibilities. We'll return to the difficulties and importance of this term in our second podcast. Labels aside, there are many layers to the issue of identifying carers. And the first goes back to where we started, and carers being invisible and out of sight. A lot of the carers we spoke to felt that other people simply didn't get what they were going through. Public awareness and understanding of what it is to be a carer varies from country to country. A nil of Carers Worldwide works across developing nations like India, Nepal and Bangladesh. He says the lack of public awareness in these countries, and thus the lack of policies or services that support carers, is reflected in the absence of any effort to track or record them. Of course there are statistics are there about various issues, number of people uh, suffering from mental health issues, or people with a disability, people with dementia, all these issues need a caregiver, but absolutely nothing. In country like in, uh, India or Nepal, we do census every year and there is no question asked around the caregivers. Do, does the family has caregiver who is looking after somebody who needs that care? Absolutely nothing. And uh, sometime uh, we also count how many animals we have in the families but not the role played by the caregivers. Anil also said that culture plays a massive role, citing the huge stigmas that surround many health conditions in some developing countries. Indeed, Aparna, the carer from India that I mentioned earlier, told me how she'd seen other parents of children with disabilities hide their child away. If a carer feels ashamed of their situation, then of course they're unlikely to reach out for support or to talk to people about what they're going through. Traditions of family are important too. Uh, partly in developing countries, everybody expected that there is a concept of joint family or extended family. Uh, so there is a lot of support system is there and also culture. It is expected that uh, you look after your parents or relatives who is sick or uh, disabled and all. Unfortunately, last 10 to 15 years, that concept of joint family and extended family is eroding faster than one could imagine. Now more and more nucleus families and people who are living in rural areas are most of them generally are elderly because agriculture is no more a profitable uh, business. Youngsters are moving to the cities in search of good uh, employment opportunities or education or health facilities. So um, and the caring, the role of caring is falling on this individual. The UK is actually quite well regarded globally in terms of care awareness. We have well-established national charities like Carers Trust and Carers UK and high-profile awareness events like Carers Week and Carers Rights Day. But support workers told us that there's still a lot more that needs to be done. That, for example, support and understanding for carers in the workplace lags well behind what's afforded to those with parenting and childcare responsibilities. The presence of stigmas around healthcare conditions is still felt. The carers we spoke to reported that. And the concept of family is, of course, global. Shazia mentioned it in that first clip I played. I still think that uh, caring is not fully understood and until it's fully understood the role of carers can't really be fully appreciated. So we do need to raise more awareness so that people understand and appreciate what people do but appreciation should also go hand in hand with concrete support. For carers to access that concrete support that Emily mentions there need to be gateway mechanisms that open the door to it. And given what we've heard from Shazia and Becky about how they came to their caring roles and the barriers they found in getting support, it might take someone else to help a carer to come forward and point them in the right direction. Healthcare professionals are extremely well placed to do this effectively, but the responsibility falls far wider. We have a number of different programmes of work where we look at best practice about how people are identifying carers and there are a huge number of places that this can happen. So we have supportive employers who are looking at their employees who are carers and identifying them that way. Uh, pharmacies locally have had different carer identification programmes. Uh, GP practices can do it. Certainly hospitals, when people come to visit, uh, and look at people coming through the door. Banks and financial institutions can look at third party agreements. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that people can identify carers to make sure that they get the advice and information that they need. 
Whilst I was interviewing carers in Leeds, I came across the yellow card identification scheme. It's really simple. It really is just a yellow card with a referral form on it. It's available at GP practices across the city. Anyone in a practice can fill it in with the carer's details and send it on to carer's lead support services, who will then follow up. The scheme generates about 500 referrals a year this way. It's really effective because in prompting staff to ask the question, are you a carer, it not only drives carer identification, but it also encourages practices to consider what they're doing to support carers and whether they could be doing any more. Another byproduct of the scheme is that it's opened doors to practices and carer support services working more closely together in a range of ways. Off the back of the scheme, carers leads have delivered training to practice staff, they've used surgeries to run carer clinics, one-to-one -one sessions and awareness events as well. It was first introduced about 10 years ago and since then the yellow card has been adopted by all GP practices in Leeds and it recently won a health service journal award. Not bad for what really is just a brightly coloured bit of card. It's worth noting that one referral doesn't fix everything for a carer like Shazia. Most of us have experienced how notoriously disjointed healthcare systems can be. Doctors and departments don't always talk to each other and people can drop through the cracks. In the UK we have annual carers assessments, but supporting carers is about much more than formal evaluation. There needs to be continued communication and check-in throughout a person's time caring, at every appointment or visit for example, to check that they're coping and connect them with any additional help that they might need. Now, although Shazia was a young carer when her mum first became ill, and therefore in one of the groups that often remains hidden, she was identified as a carer. But that alone's not enough. For it to mean anything, for it to help Shazia in any way. She needed advice and information. In the, in the early days especially, do you feel like you were given enough information? No, not at all. I think if I hadn't sort of gone out of my way to look for the information, I don't think I, I would have come across it, or I don't think like the doctors or anyone really thought about the effect that it would have on me, and even to give my mum more information, really. Beyond being told her mum's condition was incurable, Shazia didn't get anything so much as a leaflet. And she told me she was the sort of person always on the lookout for leaflets and information when she was at appointments and things. In a study involving carers of cancer patients, over 70% said they felt they needed more information to adequately provide care. Now, it's fairly obvious of me to suggest that simply telling a young girl her mother has a degenerative condition and not much else is woefully inadequate. But what information to supply and how to deliver it is quite dependent on the individual. Not every carer wants to know it all. What's important to understand, perhaps, is the depth and breadth of what carers might need to know. Shazza had never heard of Parkinson's when her mum was diagnosed. Certainly at this point, gaining an understanding of her mum's condition was really important to her. But that was just the start of it. shazza has been going to scans and blood tests with her mum since she was nine. One of the first things I asked her when we met was to describe her mum's condition. Um, so it sort of mainly fluctuates between dyskinesias, which are involuntary movements, and they're a main side effect of the dopamine tablets that she's on. And then other times she's quite stiff, so she might need a lot of help just um, moving out of the chair to the bed or just helping up and down the stairs or to the loo or kitchen or whatever. Um, and she also sometimes can feel quite emotional and overwhelmed, um, and quite depressed, just general low mood. Um, that's probably just due to the illness and she feels frustrated. Her depth of understanding of her mum's symptoms, her medication and its side effects was instantly apparent. And it bears testament to the huge amount of medical knowledge, of care skills and of emotional intelligence that Shazia has had to acquire, largely under her own direction. According to a 2015 report on the state of caring in the US... Of the 57% of carers that assist with medical tasks, only 14% report receiving any training. I think the first few years were probably the hardest, and now I've, I've sort of come to accept it. But, and I think I've sort of come to take on the um, like aim to make, to make sure that no 11 or 12-year-old is in the same position that I was. On top of medical and care duties, Carers have to learn to navigate healthcare systems, liaise with specialists and other practitioners, coordinate care professionals and manage prescriptions. And then there's everything else that carers take on. The running of a home, the managing of affairs. Shazia had been shopping, cooking, driving, cleaning, paying bills and budgeting since she was in her teens. 
Shazi's ability to thrive in spite of a lack of support and her defiantly positive attitude in the face of her experiences shouldn't give the wrong impression. Neither should the fact that we live in an information-rich era in which technology puts boundless sources of information at our fingertips act as any sort of illusion. Guidance is crucial to carers. The demands put upon them are varied and changing as their situation fluctuates according to the condition of the person they support and the various other factors around them. And remember all that uncertainty that Shazia talked about. That doesn't necessarily fade. Lots of carers we spoke to described it as a constant presence in their life. They found that caring could be highly unpredictable. Carers don't know what's just around the corner and so often have no idea of what help or information they might need, let alone where to find it. Here's Emily one last time. I would say that advice and information is actually the first step. And without that, it's very hard to move on to anything else. Most people, when they start caring, don't really know how things will unfold. And they quite often are learning on their journey. And you don't know what you don't know. This podcast was brought to you by Havas Links. For more information about the things you've heard, or to read the white paper, go to invisible-army.com. In the next episode, we talk about relationships. Because it's all a bit of a role reverse, it can get a little difficult. And it's a bit weird for me telling her what to do. But it sort of has a bit of a comedy factor as well. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'd like to thank all of our contributors for their participation in time, especially Becky, Shazia and the other carers and support workers we interviewed throughout our research. This podcast was written and narrated by me, Paul Eccles, with editorial support from Caroline Crampton, and production and editing by Dan Lord in the Studio 6 team at Havas Links. Thanks also go to Mark Duffy and Soap Studio for their support. <laughs>